So the book or the Pasha of Taruma, firstly, it begins to deal with this offering, this voluntary offering that is brought by the people for the construction of the Mishkin. So what is the Mishkin? What is going on here? And what can we learn from this amazing Pasha? So firstly, let's look at what the text says at the beginning, beginning in chapter 25, verse 1, where it says, The Lord said to Moshe, so, vai the beer Hashem el Moshe lay more. So, the word that's translated as Lord here, the divine name, is the four letter name of God, Hashem, the Vav, He, and sorry, the Yod, He, Vav, and He. And so, Moshe goes on to say to, sorry, Hashem goes on to say to Moshe, the beer el Bnei Yisrael. So, speak to the children of Yisrael. So again, we've got an issue here in the text, in the English, where it's translated B'nai as people. So again, if it was people, it would be Am Yisrael. Am is the Hebrew word for people, but it's using the term B'nai, B'nai Yisrael, and they can only be translated as children. So speak to the children of Yisrael, and the yik huli, and take, take for me, or take to me, to Ruma, a contribution. So you'll see here that I've highlighted this word in black here, to Ruma. So this is the word that is used for the name of this Pasha. And it goes on to say, from every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution, the to Ruma, for me. And I just want to quickly again draw our attention to what's happening here in verse 8 and verse 9, because this is where it introduces the Hebrew text, introduces to us some important words. And the first one is, and let them make me a sanctuary. So a sanctuary here is the word mikdash, mikdash, that I may dwell in their midst. Now, this word dwell in their midst as well is important, and we will come to that. And then in verse 9, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern, also in, in the Hebrew it's ki kol asher ani mar a, all that I show you, or techa to you, et tavnit. So this is the word pattern, tavnit, and then it says ha mishkan. And this again, I've highlighted this word here for us in black, ha mishkan. So the... Mishkan. So these are two important words. So they shall make for me a sanctuary, a mikdash, that I may dwell in them. Now the word dwell in them is the Hebrew word ve, veshachanti, which comes from the word shachan, which means to dwell. It's the idea of dwelling with or in something. And interestingly, is where we get the word Shekinah from, Shekinah. So the word Shekinah does not turn up in Torah. It doesn't turn up in Tanakh. It is a word that has been created and taken from the word Shekhan to dwell, uh, which makes up the word Mishkan, to describe the glory, the visible and tangible glory of Hashem that manifested itself in the Mishkan, this tabernacle, and also in the Beit HaMikdash, in the, the Holy House, which is the temple, which was built in the days of Shlomo HaMelech. So Shekinah, Shekinah is describing this glory, this manifestation of God. And of course, there's a lot to be said about that, but we're not going to be teaching on that particular word here in this lesson. But it's an important word that you need to know about. So we have Mikdash and Mishkan. So you will predominantly hear the term Mishkan, Mishkan. And this word is always used in reference to this tabernacle, this tent of meeting that Moshe Rabbeinu and the children of Israel are about to construct here in the wilderness. And there's something else I just want to quickly talk about in regards to this word, um, to dwell, that I may dwell the shachanti. So this word is important in relation, in relation sorry, to the word that comes after it, in their midst. 
So verse 8 in the Hebrew reads this, the asu and make li for me or to me a mikdash, a sanctuary, the shachanti and I will dwell betocham in their midst. And this is a really important idea that is communicated in the in the way the language is working here and that is it's God is not saying that I so that I may dwell in this thing that you are building no I so that I may dwell in you may I dwell in your midst God doesn't dwell doesn't put his presence in buildings his presence can manifest in buildings but only because we are there. And this is this is important. This is something that the rabbis will talk about. That God doesn't dwell in what we build. He dwells in us. And that the way we build should be an outworking and a manifestation because of his presence. So Shachan, dwelling with us, dwelling in us. So again, Mishkan, an important word. Uh, whenever you hear Mishkan, it's talking about this portable. And that's, and again, this is very important as well. This is a portable tabernacle. It moves with the people. It moves with the people. So this is, a, again, this is a wonderful thing. What was happening and occurring in Bar Midbar in the wilderness was that God moves with them in a tangible way so they could learn to have an anchor point in the natural of what is occurring in the spiritual, in the supernal realm, in the eternal realm, that their connection, because there's a paradox here, there's a very interesting paradox here, is that God, the eternal nature of God, manifests itself in a finite thing that is humanity and that is built by humanity. So again, the B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, they needed an anchor point. They needed an anchor point. And there's something really quite amazing, quite wonderful, quite delicious, really, that is going on with the word teruma that I will focus in on soon. So just quickly pointing out, where does the word mikdash, so the word for sanctuary, where does, what does this come from? So you'll notice when you look at this word, sanctuary, look at the last three letters. They form the word kadash or kadosh, which is the word to be holy, to be set aside. So a sanctuary is a place set aside because of holiness. And this word mishkan, again, we've talked about this because we said that I may dwell in their midst. So what was the word there? Vishachanti. So shachan. Well, look, this is the word that names what a tabernacle is. And again, this is really important to us because a tabernacle is a place of dwelling. It is a mishkan, shin, kaf, nun spells the word shachan, to settle, to reside, and also to enthrone. Very interesting there. So the mishkan was a place of engagement. It was a place where we could learn, or the anchor point within the physical realm, that we learn that we dwell with Hashem because He dwells with us. And I love this. Again, I love this idea of, of how God moves towards us. He reaches towards us. He enacts a significant part of the relational process and how He draws us to himself because in the drawing to himself what well, it's because he's moving towards us and he just wants us to be aware of that and he does that <laughs> the pattern of the mishkan is a process of moving towards him a process of learning in the faith journey that he dwells with us therefore we dwell with him so the details about certain items listed as teruma can be found in subsequent Pasha. So, so what does this mean? So we've got a very quick list here, verses 3 to verse 7, that just quickly lists off these things. And what you'll find is that in subsequent Pashas, it goes into the detail. So what is, why does he say... In verse 6, oil for the lamps. What is that? Okay, well, in the next Pasha, he talks specifically about that, how 
to make it and how this is olive oil, olive oil to kindle the near tamid, the continual light. The spices for the anointing oil, we find the detail for that in Shemot 30, 23 to 25. So this is the 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 spices that are added into the olive oil to give it its wonderful fragrance and wonderful texture. And there's something about the the aroma, the aroma of God's presence. Oh my gosh. Anyway, we will we'll dive into that in greater detail. And then you've got the Shoham stones. So these were the two stones needed to meet the requirements of the ephod. So it doesn't even, well, it does say it says here for setting up for the ephod. Again, we're going to come across the greater detail for that. And you'll find that we'll come across that in chapter 28, verses 9 to 12. And then, of course, you've got the stones for the ephod and the breastplate. It doesn't even list those here. Just, yeah, but again, we're going to find the greater detail for that in chapter 28, verses 6 to 30. Okay, so let's look at, well, actually, before I do that, I just want to quickly talk about the elephant in the room. (laughs) Sorry for using the terminology, but the elephant in the room, and that is what happens in verse 5 of this Parsha of chapter 25, verse 5. Where we read, what do we read? In the English, we read tanned ram skins or, and goat skins and acacia wood. Now, for those of you who have a little bit of insight into the Hebrew, um, you would have heard of this word when I read it to you in the Hebrew. So, ve'orats, ve'orot, sorry, and skin of the alim, so this is ram's Rams, it's in the plural, ram skins, that are mi adamim, mi, mi, adim, mi adamim, okay, so they are dyed red. Mi adamim means dyed red, so it's a red color. So ram skins that are dyed red, and then it says the orot and skins of the tachashim. So again, this is in the plural, and this comes from the word tachash. What is a tachash? Because this is quite the debate, quite the debate. And let me be honest with you, we we don't really know. We don't really know. There is there are there are you know people talk about certain things, they say it's this, they say it's that. There is a lot of debate around this. And so what I what I suggest is that we sort of let's look at what Rashi says to start our conversation. This mythical beast, this mythical animal. Because uh, Rashi points out something very interesting to us in, in relation to the skins. Again, what are these skins used for? In this particular reference, it's talking about the coverings of the Mishkin. So when we create that, when the Mishkin was created, again, we're going to get to the detail of that. There are coverings put over the top of it that makes it like a tent. Now, what we do know, or what is commonly accepted is that the Tachash was a beautiful multicolored animal that existed only at that time and then became extinct. Now that is debatable as well. Was it only at that time? We're not sure. Okay, um, But there is a, some sort of consensus amongst the sages and you'll find this particular reference in the Talmud in the portion Shabbos uh, 28 side A. So there is there is only really one consensus regarding the tachash, and that is that no one really knows what type of animal this skin came from. Now, I want to point out to you that this is not the only place that this word is used. Okay, so we we have tachashim, the plural. You're going to find here in this verse. You're going to find in twenty six fourteen, and you're also going to find in that in thirty six nineteen that is referring to the mishkan the Mishkan covering, but it's also uh, used in the plural in 35.7 and 35.23. And here's the interesting thing, because remember I mentioned, I said that this is a portable Mishkan, okay, this is a portable tabernacle. So there we'll find the details for this, that it can be put up and it can be put taken down so that it can be moved. And it was moved in a very 
very precise and detailed way. And this was to, and this is pretty interesting, to protect the people that were moving it. Because there is something profoundly otherworldly okay, about this Mishkan and about the objects that were made by the hand of man, but infused with the with the aura of the eternal, the atmosphere of God and of his heavenly tabernacle, his heavenly temple, that sits in these objects that made them dangerous, actually dangerous. And we see this in the story of David Hamalek when he's trying to bring the ark back into Jerusalem. And one of the one of the priests, or one of the persons that has the... Because he, he does... What he does there is he doesn't follow protocol. And now we're starting to become aware, what, what is the, the issue of protocol? The issue of protocol is because of the sanctity and the holiness. It's what allows us to understand that there is a way of doing certain things with God that require us to understand the honor and the sanctity of these things. And you'll find as we read through the book of Shemot, and through the book of Vayikra, that there is a very specific way to move the Mishkan. There's a very specific way to move the Ark. So it's got poles, and we'll see this when we when we when we um, move on through this lesson. That they had to be covered. These objects had to have their own coverings, and those coverings, da da, tachashim. They're the same skins. Now. Again, you'll find the, the greater detail for that, for the coverings of the Mishkan articles when they're to be re- transported predominantly in the book of Bamid by the book of Numbers. And if you want to quickly look those up, because this is where the, the word is in the singular, so it just says Tachash, a Tachashkin. So you'll find that Numbers 4, 6, 4, 8, 14, 4, 11, 4, 12, and 4, 14. And there is... <laughs> Just to sort of let, let us realize that there is something quite profoundly mysterious about this whole process and about this tachash, as you'll find this word used again in the singular in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, 10. I encourage you to go and have a look at that. So anyway, let's move on from there. So again, I want to come back to this word teruma. So here on our first page, of course, we have this word. So you can see it here in the Hebrew. So let's look at the word teruma to see a, a deeper connection. So the root of this word is room, room. So resh, you'll see this, the three letters in the middle, a resh, a vav, and a mem. And you always notice that when I, uh, one of the, the best way to articulate a resh is that you've got to learn to roll your R's. So some people find this quite difficult. Some people find it very easy. So it's taruma, taruma. So the word room means to uplift. <laughs> this is interesting. To be high above, exalted, to reach high. So what is going on here? So this word first appears in this verse, 25 verse 2, and is translated in Chumash as a raised up portion. Now, I'm pointing this out now because, we, again, when we see this in the English, it's translated as a contribution. Sometimes they translate it as an offering. But really, really, what's going on here? It's saying, bring to me a raised up up portion, a raised up portion. So we see this word used again in Shemot 35.5 when we see Moshe communicate the above verses to the people. And this is quite, again, this is a very important thing to notice what's happening in the text here, is that there is there's always a moment where God initiates Something, And this is what he does here. God initiates the people to move collectively by the motivation of their heart to bring something voluntarily. Voluntarily. So he's asking for a response. God's asking for a response. And then when we get into chapter 35, verse 5, where this is repeated, we hear, so in, this, in the beginning first part, Hashem is speaking to Moshe. 
And then in the next part, Moshe is speaking to the people. He's relaying the words of Hashem to them. And so we see God initiating, and then we see the moment where God waits to see if mankind will respond and how they will respond. This is wonderful. And why is this important? Because if you recall when I talked about in our first first lesson on this book, I talked about the idea that this starts to introduce to us how God starts to facilitate co-laboring with him. So if you look about at the beginning of the book of Shemot, it's about God just doing things sovereignly. So he sovereignly moves to bring the Bnei Israel out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt. And then he starts to introduce to them how they, their potential in relationship with him as co-laborers. So they hear, they see, but the hearing and the seeing is to know, which is the process of responding. We, 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 we learn how to know somebody through our response and then through our interaction and then through our union. So it's what we do together that builds community. It's what we do together that builds relationship. So God is initiating relationship here. So other occurrences of the word Teruma, Shemot 29, 28, and Vayikra 7, 14, and 32 uses the word to refer to the portion of the thanksgiving offering that is set aside as the kohanim, right, for their personal use, as does Bar Midbar through 5 9. So, but remember, again, this book of Numbers, Vayikra, is Leviticus. So, Bar Midbar 15 19 to 20 talks about the first part of the dough made into a cake and given as teruma. So Bar Midbar 18.24 deals exclusively or expressly with the portion provided for the Levi, the Levites. So as you can see, this word is used in several contexts. However, if we look into the word itself, we see something very profound and deeply personal. So it is considered that there is no truly adequate word in the English language to relay the meaning of the word teruma. So Rashi comments that teruma implies a separation of a portion of one's resources to be set aside for a higher purpose. We see this in the root of this word, which I've already discussed, room, to lift up. Again, what does this word mean? To uplift, to be high above, exalted, to reach high. So the effect of teruma is to elevate the giver's perception and their concept of the purpose of wealth with which God has blessed them. It is a deeply personal choice to give teruma in this way. It is not a compelled thing. Oof. And I, please hear me on this. Teruma should never be compelled. God doesn't compel it here. He's saying, ask them of every man who is moved in his heart. So Teruma is directly related to the response of our heart in desiring to lift something up. So in relation to the Mishkan Teruma, we see a deep desire from the people to be a part of something that is beyond human perception. The building of a temporal structure that was to be infused with the supernal. So this is a beautiful concept as it shows that we have the capacity to take a natural resource and elevate it into the supernal realm. And that this elevation occurs because it is lifted with us as we present ourselves with the Taruma. And this is wonderful. This, oh, this, is, this is a wonderful concept and idea to me. Because it means when... When we go, when we enact the process of bringing a teruma to Hashem, that thing that we are bringing is 
becoming elevated because we are drawing near. And as we draw near, the act of coming near elevates us as well. And there's something else as well that I, I really contemplated about this and started to think and, and what it means to be a part of building something like this. And what God was initiating here is that he was allowing them to invest their heart's desire into potential reality that was a reflection of the divine. So God talks about this and, and presents this idea in places in that the, the earthly temple the earthly Mishkan is a representation of something that exists in the eternal realm. And he does this when he constantly says, build it according to the pattern that you were shown. Remember this in verse 9, what does it say? Ki kol ashia ani mar a, all that I show you, <laughs> o techa it Tavnit of the pattern, the pattern that you were shown. So Moshe Rabbeinu was shown a reality, an eternal, supernal reality that could have a manifestation in the natural realm. And Hashem was saying, now invite the people to connect their hearts to that thing by their offering. Because when you bring something, you are investing into the potential of that thing the potential reality of what it can be and what it is as a representation of the supernal, of the divine. You have a place in that. You allowed that thing to have a representation in the natural. So that when you look at it, and here, and this is amazing, when you look at it, the memorial testimony and the witness of that thing sitting in creation connects you with the reality of what is just beyond your perception. So you start to believe by looking at it, that represents the heavenly Mishkin. If that represents it, and I have invested in that, I have a part of that, my heart is in that, that means I'm connected to that, that means I can know that thing. I too can be shown the pattern of that thing and have the reality of that pattern now having a voice in me, which becomes an invitation to the generations. Amazing. I mean, it's just an amazing way of looking at it. And it just inspires me. It really does. It inspires me. Ah, oh, We bring heaven to earth in the way we build. Oh my gosh. Because we are building, our hand is joining with his hand. So wonderful. So wonderful. Uh, so anyway, let's just quick, I just wanted to quickly as well, just show you each of these objects. Because they're quite amazing. Now, if you're interested, where I got these things from, let me just quickly show you this book. So I've just recently purchased this book. And let's just bring my webcam up. I completely forgot that I turned that off. <laughs> so anyway, look, here is this book that I've just purchased recently. And I've been trying to get hold of this for a while. And you can get, so this is, uh, it's called The Mishkan, The Tabernacle, Its Structures and Its Sacred v Vessels, the Kleinman Edition. And you can get this through Art Scroll as well, Art Scroll, the Art Scroll website. And it's just wonderful. And so the pictures that I've gotten that I'm going to show you are all from this book. And here's something really wonderful as well, is that they developed, this was ori originally developed as interactive software where people could learn about the objects and the building of the Mishkin. So they could learn how to study it and visualize it and have that reality start to have a voice within their imagination. Because <laughs> then what can you do? Because their, their goal, and this is all the, this a rabbinical thing that is done, these guys at Art Scroll, because they wanted people to be able to experience the reality of this thing. And what, what a wonderful labor of love these, these people did. And so purchase the book, go and purchase the book if you're interested. It's pretty wonderful. So here we have the Ark. The Aaron, the Aaron. So that's how we say it in Hebrew. 
Uh, they shall make an ark of acacia wood. And you can, you've got there the, the, the scripture verse for it. The asu and make aron at say shitim. Okay, so make it the, the box itself, the, the inside box. And here's something interesting. I, I don't have the picture for this here, but there's three arcs, three arcs combined into one here. So the, what they had to do first is they created a, a box of shitim, this acacia wood. And then they created another box of gold that would go inside. So that's the inside sleeve of gold. And then there's another box of gold that goes on the outside. So you've got gold, then you've got the, the wood, then you've got gold again, and it all creates this one thing. And then and then if you can just see, you've got this wonderful a network of gold that goes around it as well, which is called a, like a crown. And then you've got these golden staves, these golden poles. There. So that inside that is Shitham wood again as well. But it's just wonderful. And then you've got this cover, <laughs> the cover of it that is one piece of gold. It's a talent of gold in just this cover alone. And it's it's molded, it's hammered. So it's not forged, it's not melted and poured into a mold. It has to be worked with the hands. Think about the the artistry. Oh my gosh, that goes into this thing. But look at it, it's just, a, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And here's the thing that's quite wonderful about this, is that this ark used to precede them into battle, where they could see it. Oh my gosh, imagine this. And and you can see this with the, um, when one of the battles between the, the uh, Israel and the the Philistine, the Philistines, and when the ark turns up, there's this great roar. And, and it just the fear that comes into the heart of the Philistines when they see this ark, they're like, oh no. <laughs> uh, it just rem- it's just, again, remarkable stuff. We're not going to go into the great detail of all these things. But again, it's, it's there if you want to learn about it as well. Okay, and then we have the shulchan. So these are the, the things that most people don't learn about. So a shulchan, shulchan, you'll see that up there, that Hebrew word. That means it's this table, and this table is just amazing. <laughs> so these are the things that sit uh, before the partition curtain. So you come into the Mishkan, into the, this tabernacling tent, and then you've got the 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 um, the shulchan, you've got the menorah, and then you've got the golden altar. And we'll get to those as well as we go through this. But this, look at this thing. Look at it. This is, this is a, a truly, a, and again, um, it'll come, when you come into the detail of this thing as well, we'll see that. It's just ornate. It is You've got all these poles and these golden poles. You've got a golden table. And again, it's got its own poles as well, so it could be carried. Because it had, this had to be covered as well with the tachash skin. But the other thing is what they call the bread of surfaces. These things are they are quite remarkable as well. You can see the shape of them. Now, you can't quite see the detail very well here, but they're, 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 they're baked into a specific shape. And then they put a certain amount of them on this table. And then you, you see up the top here, there's a spoon. There's a golden spoon. but And so there was a golden spoon full of frankincense that sit, sat at the top. Again, look at, look at it. It's just wonderfully ornate and quite brilliant. And then we have the menorah. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. So that word lampstand there is the word menorah. Now, you'll be asking yourself why are there, there are two different types of menorah here because there is there is a different um, a debate. What did the menorah actually look like? And so what Rashi does is he talks about the both of them. So you have the first one at the top here, which has got rounded branches, and then you've got another one here that has straight branches. Now, there is you, when you ever see a, a menorah, they do tends to always be this one with the rounded ones. And there's a reason for that, because after the sacking of the second temple and the destruction in 69-70 AD by the Romans, they if you go to Rome and you will see that there is a 
there's a, a fresco in stone that's been made that commemorates the destruction of the temple and them sacking it and looting it and taking all the things that were in there. And one of the things they took, of course, on that stone fresco is this picture of a menorah, quite big. They were large. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. These things were big. There's a lot of gold here. <laughs> um, and it has curved branches. So that's why people tend to believe that that was. But again, there is... There is evidence that it was actually shaped like this. So we don't know what the first menorah actually looked like. It could have been, it could have had straight or it could have had curved branches. But anyway, again, wonderful to look at. Now, this is something as well. Just, oh gosh, the detail here is just wonderful. What, the, what, what they have done here is pretty fantastic. And I put this in here because it shows you how they created the weaving for the, the, the twisted flax or the linen. So this is how they make linen. And what they did to um, compose it together with linen, with so twisted flax, twisted wool, twisted purple, and scarlet wool. This is what they look like. So this interweaving, very intricate weaving together of the different strands. It's wonderful. And, of course, here's the, the Michigan covering. On the top now, again, there is conjecture and debate. Were the top layer, so we've got the tachash skins, which is the sort of multicolored lot, and then you've got these dyed red uh, ram skins. Were they separate or were they made together as one layer? So again, there's debate about that, and you can lie, lean either way, but that's what it looks like. So the the, the bottom layer or the, the layer that was closest that created the first layer was actually a woven layer, and it had all these things woven into it. Again, please go and read the 10, go and read the, the verses so that you can see that for yourself. But it just helps to see because there's just wonderful, wonderful laboring and, and just craftsmanship that went into building this thing. It really was, must, it would have been fantastically amazing to see. Fantastically amazing. And, you know, because you didn't, you don't have these things in, with the temple. The temple didn't have these outer layerings, didn't need them. But this Mishkin, this portable tab tabernacle did. All right, and then we come to the beams, okay? The Karashim beams. And what they looked, again, covered in gold, covered in gold, made with, so the sheathen wood, again, the acacia wood is what's in inside these, then they're coated in gold, they're, they're interlinked, they're layered, again, the details all there for you to go and look at, it's just wonderful stuff, wonderful, wonderful stuff, what a, it's just amazing, I, I'm just in awe of this, this the, what they constructed here, okay, and now we can see a top view, which is pretty cool, of the the walls themselves, so the walls of the Mishkin were solid, okay, solid wood, and then coated in gold, coated in gold. It's amazing! This thing was spectacular. But again, they it had to be taken apart, so they all interlinked. Again, it talks about this in later things, and there you have the what they, the parochet, the parochet, which is the partition curtain. Now, here's an interesting thing, because what they've done here is this, if you look at the text, it it talks about that there were kiravim on here. Now, they've got it down here as a lion, and um, on the other side, they actually have uh, the picture of an eagle as well. So there's, and there's interesting detail there, but this is this is the way it would have looked in its layout, but it would have had kiravim on it. What does that mean? Again, there's lots of debate here. You can read Rashi and find out about that. And then we have the copper altar, the copper altar. So this is what sat, sat outside the Mishkan. Now you're probably, probably saying, so Carl, wasn't there a golden altar inside the Mishkan? Yes, there was. That comes in the next Pasha. <laughs> we get to look at that then. So here we have the copper altar, and, the, and here we have the details. Now there's a, a, some, one thing I want to point out is there is debate about what the actual height of this altar was. Because it was something that you would walk up to. It was it was had a ramp, a ramp made out of earth that you would walk up to. You didn't climb steps, so you'd walk up to it. And then they could. It talks about that they could walk around the outside of it as well. So how big was it? How wide was it? Uh, all sorts of it, 
all sorts of different ideas behind that. So in the text, it says that it's five cubits long, five cubits broad, so it was some sort of square. What's a cubit? A cubit, basically, is the distance between your elbow and the tips of your uh, fingers. So that's what it looks like. Uh, again, there's all sorts of wonderful things going on here, just ornate detail, and all of these things, uh, yeah, they really do allude to some pretty fascinating things. Pretty fascinating things. <clears throat> All right, and then we have the outer courtyard. Okay, so now the outer courtyard was not solid. Okay, the courtyard of the Michigan was surrounded by the walls, by a wall made from sheets of, well, they're, like, they're called curtains, basically curtains, and then you had the, the door, the entryway into the courtyard. So this is what sat around the Mishkin. And I just, they really did a wonderful thing here as well in, in showing the how the the curtains themselves were braided or woven together. I thought this was pretty cool. You've got the silver hook here at the top, which was hung to. This is where we get the word vav, and why vav means hook. Because the silver vav hook. You've got a copper ring, you've got a silver belt, you've got a cross beam, cap, curtains, oh. A lot of detail, a lot of detail. This thing was spectacular, just spectacular. And so those are all the objects that we find in the in this Pasha, in Pasha Taruma. So we've got some of the detail of some things, but we've got a lot of other things we don't have detail. The next Pasha talks about the priestly garments and the golden altar. So that's, that's a lot of fun. And there's a lot of things going on here. It's just wonderful. Can't wait to talk to you about it. But just in closing, I just want to say one thing very quickly, very quickly, about something that we can learn about this, the walls of the Mishkin, which I, th I found um, was quite, quite profound. And really, again, it talks to this idea of why building something like this what it does, what it does, what it did for the children of Israel, and the idea behind it, what it does for us when we realize that we too have a part to play in this. There's a really wonderful idea, teaching that comes through, and it talks about this in the Talmud, and that is, is that when we study the Mishkan, when we study about it, how it was built, the different parts and the construction of it, that we too are contributing to when it was built itself. Because we're allowing our hearts to engage with the reality of it. This thing existed. Pardon me. This thing existed. This thing is real. It was real. It was an ark. <laughs> there still is an ark. We don't know where it is. I long for the day for it to be revealed. And there's a lot of debate around this, and where it is, where it could be, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, but this thing, you know, the word of God tells us about this for a reason. Now listen to this, the walls of the Mishkan. So in 26 verse 15, it says, Via sita, and you shall make for yourself it hak rashim, okay? The pillars or the beams, li Mishkan for the Mishkan. So these are the ones... These are the things here. These are the beams, the karashim, the kirashim of for the lamishkan uh, at say at say shitim. So wood of shitim or mudim pillars. So what is there's something going on here? So it is taught that the reason the Torah uses the phrase and let them take for me at the beginning of this pasha is because the children of Israel were already in possession of everything required. So the question is asked, where did the etsi shitim come from? Where did the wood come from? There's a lot of wood involved here. <laughs> a lot of it. And you've got to realize that this wood had to be, um, they had to be made into beams. So they weren't carrying around pre-made beams. They didn't go down to Mitre 10 or, you know, your whatever it is in your country, the local hardware store or the mega hardware store, and they say, I need a, a beam of such and such, and I need uh, 50 of them or 100 of them, you know. They didn't do that in Egypt. They didn't go down to beams R us as they were leaving and say, I need to grab some shitim uh, for my journeys because who knows why well, I might need it somewhere. Where did this come from? 
Okay, so there's a lot of ideas about where it came from. I don't want to get into that, but listen to this. So there is a Hasidic teaching that relates the word shitim to folly. And hak, hakrashim to the pillars to falsehood. Now, where do they get this idea? So the word falsehood in Hebrew is the word shakir. Now, if you look at this word here, for beams, karashim, and we'll see this in the Hebrew text, ha karashim. So you've got here a, a kuf, a resh, and, and a shin. So shakir is spelled shin kesh, uh, shin kuf resh, shakir, which means falsehood. So this comes to teach us that we need to take the folly and the falsehood of this life and convert it to truth and service. The pursuit of Hashem dwelling in our lives. So the Or Chaim writes about the vertical nature of the beams, which is Omdim. So you'll see this at the, the, the last Hebrew word here is Omdim, which means to stand up like a pillar. It's a pillar standing erect. So pillars don't lie down, they stand up. That's why it's uh, translated as upright. But it's actually the word pillars. Standing erect, reaching as it were upward from the earth heavenward. This symbolizes man's spiritual goal to bind together the earthly and the heavenly realms, his lower nature with his higher potential and aspirations. Again, I got to come back to this because there's, I mean, the potential our potential in the higher realms, our potential of how we build as we co-labor with God because we what? We respond to his invitation. So we take the folly, we take the falsehood of this world and of our lives and we convert it, we change it. We bring it back to its original state. That's who we are. Our original state is crafted and fashioned in the heart and the desire of God for relationship. For relationship. So we can take, again, what is the aspect of Taruma? It is bringing, bringing of ourselves, of our heart's desire and intent to bring a contribution, something that becomes raised up. Uh, something that becomes raised up because why? Because it's connecting us to the potential and it's making that potential real in our lives. It symbolizes man's spiritual goal to bind together the earthly and the heavenly realms, his lower nature with his higher potential and aspirations. If there's something that I love about this studying the Mishkan and learning about it is that what does it do? It teaches me about my potential and it inspires me to aspire to build, to build that which connects heaven with earth, with earth with heaven, that which causes things to rise up, to rise up. Anyway, I'll leave you with that. Baruch Hashem, Shalom, Shalom. Oh, I just, again, I just want, I want to say something quickly in closing, just how much I appreciate uh, the input that everybody has been having into these lessons because of the questions that are being asked. Wonderful stuff. And the conversation, the conversation of our hearts as we bring and co-labor together to craft the language to describe God more, describe Him better, to, to, to describe Him with joy and with celebration, with reverence, and with honor. Oof, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Anyway, shalom, shalom. Baruch Hashem.